in October 1938, I was promoted to lieutenant. And we all of us, our team, or our crew of 38 lieutenants, of 1938 lieutenants, were invited by Adolf Hitler into the newly built Reichschancellery. Man, that was a building I never saw. It was glorious. It was, how shall I say, it was a mixture of classic and even older styles or elements. It has been naturally totally annihilated after the war not by warfare, but by men's doing, enemies doing. Uh, there we were invited by him, and um, we stood in the long, long mosaic hall, so-called mosaic hall, and uh, we were 800 men, Army, Air Force, Navy, lieutenants. And uh, the door opened, and with a company of only two others, he took our parade. We were standing attention in three lines. I was in the second line, and he went through very seriously, very slowly, and I think he was looking onto everybody, also myself. No, no, Hitler, Adolf Hitler. high impression. When he stood, there was not much radiation, but when he moved and when he spoke, it was more than strong impression. It was a little bit, I would say, hypnotic. hypnotic. Well, and this was through, and then rührt euch at ease, and then <coughs> Göring followed with a big staff, highly superficial, brilliant, smiling, uh, quick, not looking at everybody, and laughing. I didn't like that in comparison to the very serious man, Adolf Hitler. Now, yeah. And then later on we were in a, in a huge cupola hall and we had drinks and sandwiches and suddenly, all these things had to be put away. Adolf Hitler was appearing at, in this hall at a small balcony <coughs> high up, and he was speaking to us. And he was admonishing us that we had to follow him and him alone, and we had to follow him and him alone. He must have said it different times in his, his very impressive way of speaking. Not loud, well. And there we stood all 800 in this huge, huge uh, cupola hall. And I had been <coughs> a meeting again of my, <coughs> from my old homestead near, near Danzig two others, one of the army and one of the navy, so we stood together. And then Göring appeared. He also went in the foot, always want, went into the footsteps of Hitler. <coughs> also on the balcony uh, with a glass of champagne or whatever he had and toasted to, <coughs> the, to the big hall. Well, that was it. Um, to me, maybe I'm too Prussian, but to me, the appearance of Hitler and the, uh, his bearing was much more Im impressive than uh, Goering's. On the war school in Hanover in 1938, 
I volunteered by writing to the Air Force. I didn't, wa didn't want to stay anymore with the light artillery and with horses and things where I thought you would never see the enemy because with your guns you have been uh, more or less always behind a coverage except uh, observers. So I volunteered to the Air Force. I thought this was the right thing to see the enemy one time. And so I was accepted after a test and came to the uh, primary, must say primary uh, pilot school near Munich, Neubiberg. There I learned to fly the smaller planes, biplanes, class one weight of weight, and then it was called B2, and then I was transferred to another airport north of Munich to fly the heavier planes, the B1, and also C1 with twin engine. Yeah, and there we had, we volunteers to the Air Force, we were free to choose our branch of Air Force we wanted to go to later on. And I choose the dive bombers. But this, my report, was not, was, so to say, neglected, and I came to a fighter school. And it was a fighter school of Werneuchen, east of Berlin. And there I made a fighter course, and then I was already... And during the fighter course, we were asked again, we should become fighters only if we were with heart and blood real fighters. And who wanted else should step forward? And I stepped forward and said, I always volunteered to the dive bombers, but, but this obviously was not agreed to. And there came an officer forward, a senior officer, and said, if you really want that, I have a good connection to the Air Ministry. I think we can achieve that you come to the dive bombers. All right, I said, I want so. But meanwhile, I had my fighter course ended and I was transferred to the uh, uh, training squadron of Messerschmitt 110, the so-called Zerstörer. It was a heavy fighter. Well, I entered there, uh, and uh, I found this plane to my highest liking, as a plane to fly. Later on, it was found out that it was uh, inferior to the one engined planes, to all unengined planes with one wing, so to, as well to the Spitfire as well to the Vessel 109. Anyhow, but I liked this plane, and while I was just in that training, that uh, my transfer to a dive bomber school came. And then I said, Oh no, now I don't want it anymore. <laughs> yeah. But they said, oh, we cannot change it now. Now you have agreed to become a dive bomber and you have to go. Oh. So I think it was a bit of my life saving because the destroyers uh, had heavy, heavy losses in the Battle of Britain. Not the fighters, but these heavy fighters. And uh, then I came to the dive bombing school in eastern Prussia. It was deep winter, 39 to 40. Uh, the campaign of Poland was, uh, was over since the time. And there the school commander said to, to me, Michaud, you have learned so many things. You are such a versatile uh, pilot. These little things like uh, cement throwing, bombs and shooting, this you can do at a unit where you go to. I advise you, you get a transfer directly now to a unit. And uh, then I choose the dive bomber uh, group, yes, group, which was stationed uh, in peacetime in Graz. I had already been introduced to that when I was yet, I uh, have been coming for the, for the Air Force at all uh, as, a, as, a, as a newcomer. So I knew this group and this group at this moment after the campaign of, 
of Poland was stationed north of Nuremberg in Herzogen Aurach, and there I joined it. In the fighter school, the first we had to run through the, the two-wing plane, the Heinkel 51, which, by the way, had been fighting in the initial days in Spain. Uh, and then we came to the first um, types of the Messerschmitt, the Messerschmitt B. Yeah, we all were uh, shooting at first targets on the ground. And later on, we had been shooting at balloons which were dragged through the air by another plane on a long, long um, rope. The comradeship, by the way, was very fine on the fighter school. Yeah, yeah when we were learning to fly, we were also um, eager, if there wouldn't be a good occasion, once to parachute out of the plane. And then our instructors said to us, no, no, that is not the case that you should ever jump with a parachute because one who is, has once jumped uh, successfully without any dam bodily damage out of a plane with a parachute, he is much to, he tends to do it again uh, as at occasions which are totally unnecessary for that. We rather want you, when you have trouble with your plane, not to bail out, but to land and to save the plane. Yeah. Not to <laughs> abandon it and to let it crash somewhere. But there were some artists who, who, who managed to, to have themselves fallen out of the, of the plane, of the little B-1 planes when they were flying two of them, one in the front, one in the air, they made a certain agreement. The frontal one, for instance, was just flying, held the stick, and the other one in the rear, unfortunately, he had to lose the, the, the safety belts, so to put out his handkerchief because he had a big sneeze. So he made a, a, a movement, the pilot itself, and went, laid, laid his plane onto the rear side, and so the com his comrade fell out, unfortunately, and had to pull the parachute. So he had his parachute landing. Uh, to fly, it was a very, uh, uh, let me say, good-hearted plane. Uh, it was safe. It was not as nimble as a hundred and nine, it was, uh, it lay fast in the air. It was built very sturdy, naturally as a dive bomber for takeouts, uh, and you felt safe in it, but it was, with it, its utmost 300 kilometers low level flying, or 320, it was a bit, a bit slow. Uh, when, uh, when diving, you had no idea that the wings might not hold. Not at all. It was a... I, did, uh, I did try it out myself. When we were on our way to the Balkans, into, to Greece, to help our dear Italians there, uh, we were stationed for a short while at Bucharest. <coughs> and there I took up my plane and went as high as I could. I tried it really out. <coughs> and I arrived at something of 8,000 uh, um, meters. And there it began to hang like a ripe, a ripe plum. It couldn't go up. I had to take oxygen. And then I tried it out. I put it on the nose. I gave gas and put not out the dive brakes and wanted to see how fast I could bring it down. We had a good my 750 kilometers, and then beginning at 2000, I had to take it out of a dive, slowly. Uh, well, and so that, that not the famous veil was coming, that means the blood is going out of your of your brain and you are, and your eyes get dim. You can steer it by pulling or releasing. 
And then, at a reasonable altitude, I came clear. But my wings, my wings were uh, moving a bit. I had seen it like this. All right, and I was landing. And after a while, my chief mechanic come, came to me and said, Lieutenant, the plane has suffered a bit. Look here at the wings. The surface of the wings was undulated. Uh, the upper skin was undulated on both sides. And he said, this will now, now not fly so fast as the others. But anyhow, Lieutenant, he said, it has its hours full to send it home for, for re, um, reservicing, total reservicing, not only motor, but... And he smiled at me. Shouldn't we do it? He, said. <laughs> he smiled at me. I said, yes, we do it. <laughs> so it flew back. And there was no big report on this because also this flight I had done on my own. <clears throat> but I had been trying out the uh, Junkers 87, the Type B it was yet, B, old type, with the bully radiator under, under the nose. I came to the unit there, I first encountered the Junkers 87, flew it. And there was some occasion not far from Herzogenauer to shoot a bit and to throw cement bombs. bombs. No difficulty. Oh, yeah, yeah. And when you have not a, a queer wind from the side yeah. or enemy resistance or so, I mean, you are just diving on a, diving on a target. Yeah. And there's a huge white cross in the landscape laid out, laid out and this you have to hit yeah. or not to hit her. Yeah. What angle did you do The classical uh, diving angle was 70 degrees. Oh, okay. And by this 70 degrees, the bomb naturally, when you had released it, didn't go on in this 70 degrees. It fell to the Senkrecht, Senkrecht, yeah. So therefore, we had a leg. And this leg uh, was calculated out by a by a, a switch of our of our side, and then and then we had we had also to release the bomb in the classical altitude of 500 meters. Okay. But you could do it also deeper. But this was already already dangerous then yeah. to come out to be free from the ground yeah. Yeah. with the bomb. With the bomb. How? Not too low. With 500, you just could do it. But then you had to to pull very hard, yeah. and then you could get that, what we uh, called a veil, that means blood was uh, pressed down from your head and you didn't see for a while. And then you released the stick a bit and then it came on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or from the beginning you were pressing against, as if you were sitting on the loo, and then you could keep the, the blood up and thereby also yeah, the your The biggest sight. bombs that we could carry was 1,800 kilo. And that was one bomb, <coughs> and I never flew such a bomb. It had an armor-piecing head, as, and it was made only for battleships with uh, armored decks and so on. Yeah. Then we had a thousand kilo bomb. It was a similar had a similar uh, task, and but our normal bombs were. Uh, 500 or 250 kilos in the middle between the two, uh, two legs and under the wings, 450s, two, two. But, uh, but that was then against um, um, commercial shipping, yeah. tankers and such. I mean, like. the, when a dive bomber comes down on you as such, which I once experienced, experienced while I was shot down, and being there with the army. Uh, it is awful. But when you have a siren holding, it is, uh, must be, I haven't experienced this doubt, must be psychologically overwhelming. Uh, but the siren was fastened to the undercarriage. No. 
uh, with a little propeller, a block with a little propeller. And this, firstly, took away 10 or 20 kilometers of speed. It was already holding while you were high up and flying. So it, it uh, reported you to the enemy far ahead. It was holding naturally, not, not so very strongly, but it was a nimble hold. And then, thirdly, in a sharp turk out movement, or the turn movement, uh, at least with me, m my one siren was flying away. With a big uh, crack, <laughs> I thought it was some, some anti-aircraft. Well, it was not. And then we all, in France it was, we all uh, demounted the, these in our group first, okay. on our own. No, then we hadn't it. No. But we had another thing which was invented by a, a wing commander. To the tail, the tails of the bomb, <laughs> to the tail of the bomb, to every bomb, um, a pipe was attached, yes. And it, this was of, of uh, not necessarily of metal, it was made of a sort of a hard paper, you know? and pipes. And when the bombs fell, they started to shriek ugly. And this we call the pipes of Jericho. Ah, okay. Yeah. And these were enough. We didn't need these other things. <clears throat> uh, now, when we were fi fi uh, encountering uh, fighters in our, and we were flying in a unit, then we were not uh, doing individual movements. The group stayed together and it was a task of our gunners to shield them off. But we were flying in a formation, not in one level. We were, we, we were flying in a widespread level and also in a, in a level in, uh, in, in altitude, in different altitudes, so that our gunners could uh, better master the field. Yes, yes. And it became very effective when, in, with a new type, we had um, a double machine gun. But when we are f uh, meeting, should we meet, or in a small unit, three planes, which could happen, or singly fighters, then we have to had to to play our, our card, that means we were mostly higher movable than the, more movable than the fighters. And this especially concerns us and the Spitfire. When we had a hurricane, it was difficult. The hurricane sometimes was hanging behind us and was trying to be as narrow as our, in our, as with his curve as in ours, by pulling out his landing flaps a little, little bit. And then he was hanging there, and he was hanging there. The hurricane was not liked by us. The Spitfire, no difficulty. Spitfire was too fast for us. Okay. <laughs> uh, we did an offensive on France. It was not an invasion because France had uh, declared us a war, and we took later, later, later the initiative on the 10th of May, 1940. Well, I must say, uh, the first uh, mission to me seemed to be very unimpressive. We attacked some uh, ground target, and we uh, didn't encounter any enemy resistance, no fighter pilots, no anti-aircraft. And so when I landed, I thought to myself, I asked myself, is that the war? On the se but on the second or third mission, uh, south of Sedan, uh, my gunner, totally fresh and unexperienced, uh, should have had a good look out. And I also was careless. Uh, and was shot out of the squadron from below by a French fighter 
on an American fighter plane, uh, Ford uh, a P-40. Well, it was a drama. Uh, the bullets were uh, hitting my plane from underneath, between my legs, up to the instrumental panel. The instruments were flying away, and I saw the, the pedals, uh, the steering pedals, uh, the rim of it bending away from bullets, but I was not hit. Only my gunner sh got a shot through the lung and uh, later on died. Well, I steeply went down, obviously with, uh, with uh, uh, a tail from my, from, my, uh, from my motor. And so the French fighter didn't follow me. He th thought, obviously, this is already finished, this plan. But I wasn't finished. My motor was, uh, how do you say, grafting. Uh, standing and uh, with standing motor I looked for a landing ground but I was above the Ardennes which is a, a mountainous forest and there I squeezed myself into a steep narrow valley. I don't know how I did it, it was a difficult landing but I managed it very softly and my gunner was yet speaking to me and he wanted to that I shot him, but I was not doing so. And then peasants were coming out from a village below with a wheelbarrow, and they put him onto the wheelbarrow. And we went down to the village, and there, on the way to the village, he was dying. And the peasants were very kind. I mean, they knew already that the German army was, within hours, was there and so they behaved accordingly and uh, they dug a grave on my advice at a certain place in a fruit orchard on a, on a gable of, a, of two ways, two roads and uh, there was a solemn uh, burial and while he was laid down a woman stepped forward and she took the hand into the soil and threw the soil onto him and said in French, my son is with the Belgian forces. May he live on. And then I got a soup by the peasants and then I disappeared. And while I disappeared in uh, eastern direction up into a steep wooded uh, forest. Down on the road uh, <coughs> a motorcycle with a side van came. And I couldn't see if it was enemy or own troops. And the peasants were, were rushing to him and pointing into my direction. And I was beforehand I was hiding bef behind some bushes. And then from from down from the two motorcyclists who were of an advanced exploration unit, I heard the, the German words, come down, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> then I understood these were my Germans. <laughs> and yeah, and then I went down. Yeah, yeah. later on I had, a, I, had, I had a task in Berlin. I had to fly from, from the Normandy where we were stationed to Berlin and I laid my course over that place and I saw the, the grave full of flowers illuminating up to me. We had our very first uh, airfield in, on enemy ter territory that was the eastern Belgian town of Bastogne. And there we were in and out and in and out in the uh, landscape the peasants had fled, I am asking myself why, they had fled and cows were standing around our fat meadows uh, to the side of our airport and they were not milked. Uh, the commander gave out the uh, word that the mechanics who could milk 
While the planes were in the air and they had not much to do, they could go over and milk. A cow or a calf was not to be slaughtered, but milk all right. And then we also were eager for some tender calf. And we had a doctor, a group doctor. He was a witty, very witty chap. And I saw him stalking over onto the meadow to a calf, a young cow, putting his stethoscope onto his body and crying over, this calf must be slaughtered, it has a heart failure. <laughs> then our commander laughed and said, all right, you can slaughter. So we were slaughtered. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we had only uh, targets uh, which were a bit cumbersome to us. Troops on streets, uh, artillery positions, maybe here and there an airport yet, where the French had had some planes. Uh, but this was um, normal, normal targets. We were looking more for bigger targets, that means ships and such things, which we had, for instance, in the harbor of Calais. In the harbor of Calais. There at Dunkirk, naturally, and in the harbor of Calais, there were ships, a lot of ships. And there we were flying to Calais, I remember. And the sun was in the west. And we had no own fighter cover that time. And uh, towards the west, uh, before the sun, we could see some very fast fishes, fighter pilots. And we couldn't make it out where they are ours, Messerschmitt 109, or British. And then they came out of the sun, and then we saw the, the round sign. We called it a peacock eye. And these were Spitfires. And we were already over our target, and the Spitfires joined in our dive. They were shooting on, our, on us. And our commander gave a stiff order in the, in the wireless, <coughs> down as deep as we can. So we were making a very deep dive, and we had our diving brake, which limited our speed to 500, 550 kilometers per hour. And the poor Spitfires, they had no diving brake, and they couldn't pull out their planes anymore. And four or five of them uh, smashed into the ground. Roughly, it was in the, in the, late, in the late May. Uh, well, France was not a very liked country. We had had several wars with them. The France were several times had been invading Germany. And then we, in the First World War, we had also been deep in France. So the common relation was not, uh, not well. But when our troops now came into France, who had, French had, had uh, thought that they would be behaving cruelly not a thing. They were positively disappointed. I remember well when we were attacking on the second stage of the French campaign, where the French had built up the Vagan line for a second defense from east to west to protect Paris and so on and the south. And when we were broke, breaking through and the French columns were traveling on their chaussees, and we were diving and then we were strafing and suddenly we were seeing these columns were interspersed f with civilian cars again and again and they hindered the retreat of their own troops and uh, we were shocked that civilians had been also mutilated and attacked so our commander gave a stiff order rally back and so we went out of our attack and we went home. We had uh, three or four missions onto Dunkirk, when there were the English were shipping with all sorts of crafts, big and small, um, bringing their men and also the French, parts of the French, over to England. And uh, well, we were supposed to, to hinder that uh, shipping uh, but the weather was not uh, favorable, and so we could, could make no real dives. We came out of the clouds, 1,000 meters low, 
and did our thing as we, good as we could. And then we flew over the uh, perimeter of uh, Dunkirk, which was beleaguered by our troops and was crammed men, uh, men by men by mostly French. Deep on, I was shooting in them and they were shooting into me. And then when I were coming over the German lines, there no shot was fired onto the enemy. They just stood only and waved to me. <coughs> and that was it. They were forbidden to attack the perimeter, the enclosed perimeter of Dunkirk. It was a miraculous order from high above. I know that our generals were fuming later on, I heard it. Uh, it was a nonsense. Adolf Hitler wanted to give to the British a chance to bring out their field army. We had them had already near Lille, deep in Belgium, and we had allowed them to travel up to Dunkirk so that they could, could, could escape to England. England wouldn't have had a field army anymore for a while. He had a, he had a lot of, of humor, and when one of us failed and did a thing which he didn't like, he, he was not uh, making a loud scene, not at all. He uh, was uh, rather sharply joking at us. I remember one thing where I had, uh, where in the south, deep south of France, at the end of this campaign, we had attacked uh, uh, in a forest um, a concentration of uh, French arm armored cars who want to make an attack on us and we stalled this and thereafter we were strafing the surrounding troops. And while I was flying deep, well, maybe in 500 meters distance, a man stood up, was not taking cover, stood up and was waving towards me a long fleshy thing, maybe a panga or what, and he was a dark man, maybe a Moroccan or a Senegal Negro. And uh, that gesture meant, when you have to make a forced landing, you damned German pilot, we will make mincemeat of, out of you. And I could have shot instantly and he would have fallen dead. But this brave man, I just didn't push the buttons. I pulled over and away. And when I told this to my commander, he smiled at me and said, Mijo, Mijo, nonsense. <laughs> and uh, how did, uh, did you sometimes go into the French towns for, to relax? No, no, well, during the campaign we could not. That was after. After the campaign was over, we were stationed then in Normandy near Caen. Uh, and there we were stationed, uh, living in French chateaus, wonderful chateaus. Uh, every squadron had a chateau. Uh, and there we found uh, Burgundy and uh, south of uh, Bordeaux, Bordeaux and Burgundy. Of the years of 1912-13 and 1918-19. And they were so good and we bought them and drank them and we were in the restaurants and suddenly the French found out that we were buying away their best uh, their best uh, wines and suddenly they locked. They became more and more friendly after they had discovered that the, friend, that the German soldier was very normal. Uh, for instance, when a, a German battalion was moving in uh, as an occupancy force later in one of the towns, they were greeted by the mayor on the marketplace and the commander spoke some words and uh, their developed relations to the, to the public, even marriages here and there. And when such a battalion had to be taken away, say brought to the Russian front, they were not so well up to their task. They had to, to go to a German exer exercising ground and had to be brushed up again. It was a sweet life in France. Uh, the training and so far as we were not accustomed to fly over uh, waters, over the sea. For instance, a channel, 
It was new to us because uh, machines with one motor were strictly forbidden to cross uh, wide waters. And so we were introduced into handling swim vests, swimming vests. Life jacket, yeah. Yeah, yeah, life jacket and all that. And that was From, it. Uh, because of our limited range, we were uh, going from Caen in Normandy to Cherbourg on the Carentan Peninsula, which pointed towards Britain, and there we filled up again. And then we flew over to the region of Southampton and Isle of Wight. And in the Isle of Wight especially, well, there was a, a sea airport, Gosport. And um, later on I met a man who had an English, who had been stationed there on the watery side. And I asked him about uh, if he had been there while we were attacking. I think it was the 8th of August. And he stood up. This had, you had been stood up and <laughs> squeezed my hand. Congratulations, he said. In the morning you came and hit the dummies. And in the afternoon you came and hit us. <laughs> and I remember well, this airport had been protected by, by um, uh, balloons. A range of balloons were surrounding the airport. And uh, vessel ballons we call it, uh, and with, with wires intertwined, yeah? And while, while we were diving in, they were just, the whole circle was moving up. But we could naturally, we could, could go out and we, uh, with, with our machine guns, the two in the front, we were just shooting on them while we were pulling over and some of them were just sink, sinking away, deflated. And then uh, back on the, over the Isle of Wight, deep flying, and there were some cars and uh, traveling. And I saw one of them stopping, falling into the ditch, and all the people of the car out and taking cover, as if we would, would strafe the poor civilians. Um, uh, British fighters were... Um, uh, were cavaliers, I would say. They're also uh, highly sportive. I remember one <coughs> who was attacking uh, my wing, uh, this formation of three planes, which I had then. Uh, was attacking normally, and we were invading with our um, uh, high maneuverability. And then he was pulling out, laying his plane on the, his back's back and shooting in that position onto us, which is tactically a nonsense, but he was showing what an artist he were. <laughs> he only took Gosport, and then the Stukas were no longer flying, shortly thereafter, uh, no longer flying over to England because there had been a catastrophe despite own fighter cover, Half of a group, that means I think 15 planes were at one mission were shot down by the British fighters. And then the, our sort of planes was pulled from the Battle of Britain. Uh, I say, could say th other things which I know. For instance, the attack on Coventry. I mean, that is sometimes falsely interpreted. Uh, cover, uh, the, Attack on Coventry was our first attack on uh, also, not only, also on a civilian target, uh, which so far was avoided if, if, if at all possible. And um, the British had attacked uh, at night with their old planes, Wellingtons, with the Wellingtons, Cologne, Berlin, several times. When I was in Berlin shortly for a mission, <coughs> I was under such an attack. That means I was uh, living far from the place where they were throwing, but they were throwing just into the town. Uh, and Adolf warned again. It was five times or so. He warned and warned. And then he did this retaliatory 
attack on Coventry, but there in Coventry it had also a military meaning because in, in Coventry there were little factories or ateliers where flight instruments were fabricated around the cathedral. And there our bombers threw at night and uh, the aiming was rather modern for the time. And so they singled out these factories, but at the same time, they were also killing civilians, I think some 500 or so. But it was in a retaliatory attack, which, is, uh, which was allowed by the international law. Yeah, we were allied to the Bulgarians who allowed us to uh, come into their country. And from there, from the little airport or the airfield of Petrich, uh, just north of the Metaxas line, which was in turn what was built on the range of the Rhodopis Mountains, uh, facing Bulgaria, the north, there we attacked the Metaxas line. And uh, we, we succeeded in breaking through. It was a very modern line. It was much more modern, for instance, than the Maginot. Uh, and we were hammering on this for several days, per day, five to seven missions, sometimes. Um, it was done so. The single, the single uh, pilot, Stuka pilot, had, was assigned to a certain bunker in the Metaxas line and he had a photograph of this bunker uh, fastened to his leg and he could always compare the picture with the reality. Our mountain troops on their turn were just lying shortly before such bunker, nose in the ground. <coughs> and we had to set our, our three bombs, well, mostly three, onto the roof of the bunker. Otherwise, we had to take out the plane out of the dive and try, try anew. And when the bombs were sitting on the roof, then our mountaineers were jumping to the slots of the bunker and putting their, yeah, ja, geballte Ladung, that is a sort of Molotov cocktail out, into, yeah? And then the bunker was uh, opened. And so this bunker after bunker, I mean our group uh, had, had uh, roughly 30 planes, and they were always in the air, and so the <laughs> Metaxas line was, so to say, slowly debunkered. And our mountain troops went over and through. It was very tiring to, to, to dive, uh, to go up and to dive and to go up and to dive five times a day then you were damned tired at the end of the day. Yeah, we, we, we dived to our official, we went up to our official altitude of 3,000, and because uh, the bunkers were lying themselves on 800 and so, we mostly were higher than 3,000, and then made a sober dive onto our assigned bunker. Ah, we had to throw our bomb, we released the bomb mostly uh, 400 meters over the target. And, and then we came out uh, 100 meters, just flat. And then down the valley and there was our airport already. Ah, yeah, between Salamis and the, and the mainland. That is the bay where the famous Battle of Salamis in olden times had taken part. There were lying two Greek battleships. And these were bought from the Americans long time ago, and they had masts, uh, which was, how would you say, to gitter. And they, uh, well, they were a nuisance because they had heavy guns and could uh, molest our troops advancing at the, at the side of the, at the uh, of the, of the bay, of the big bay. And so we attacked these and set them out of action. And they were sitting then on the ground and looking a bit over the water. Um, but we had one sergeant, 
very stiff man. He, by some wind or so, came out of the target and couldn't aim his bomb rightly on one of the ships. And so he took his, his plane out, and now he was alone. And he was alone, and all the anti-aircraft on the, on the uh, side of the, on the island of Salamis and so, were concentrating on him. And he went outside of the, of the uh, anti-aircraft dome and gained altitude and dived again and set his target and then he flew alone, he flew home to the airport of Larissa. Well, and in, his, as a, in the place of his gunner, there had been one of our reporters. We had a report, a companies which were uh, chaps, journalists, yeah, for picture, for tone, and for something more. And um, this man, uh, he had a big mouse always on the ground. And, and here and then, after this double exercise on the American uh, ships, he came home and had shit into his trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and then he disappeared from our group. <laughs> In the end of May, we were stationed on an, a narrow airfield of Argos Nord in the Peloponnesos. By the way, not far from the famous ruins of Mykene. And we barely had opened our eyes after a night. Alarm came, we had to to go out to start immediately on British warships um, in the chain of the islands of Kitera and Kitera, which are lying between Crete and the, and the western tip of the Peloponnesus. We had to go very quick. Some of us uh, didn't, didn't manage to to dive, to climb into their uniforms and some pyjama I was out, out, out while I was rolling to the start I heard a huge bang one of our machines had rolling, rolled out to the start and was clashing with a, another machine just starting so two machines at the beginning of the runway uh, were exploding and burning and the, uh, the ammunition was uh, also heated up and flying in all directions and later on the bombs of the two machines get, went high, went up. And I had to start, I had to roll past this debacle and had to start past this debacle and was happy not to be, to be touched by any of the flying bullets. So out, 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 and we did our work there. And uh, then when returning back, I heard that my close friend, Oberleutnant Ebner, was in this was involved in this um, mishap and uh, later on he died. My gunner took a picture of this explosion from above. We came from, from Corinthos where we had been uh, at last after the Greek campaign and then to Mykene as I say. And their English planes had been shortly ago. And we, it was a long, long field, uh, rough field, and uh, an olive orchard to the side where we built our tents. And there, a young soldier of ours, a mechanic, was setting up his tents and was a bit flattening the ground. And what did he see suddenly? 
The hand of a buried man, fingers were coming up from, from the ground and he was ditching, ditching, it was a British soldier who had fallen there. Or maybe machine gun from above, or at least he was dead and, and uh, in, a, in a bit of, of maybe the rushing of uh, retreat, he had been just interred there in this way. So it made a big impression on my, uh, my young sol soldier. And he went, then later on he put his tent to another side and there uh, he was sleeping. And in the morning he, he mounted in his shoes and he was strongly bitten by scorpion, scorpion, which had been nighting in his shoe. Thereupon the men went got a shock. He was, could not be used and so we confined him in another tent a bit more deep in the, in the, in the orchard, in the olive orchard. He couldn't be used for any duty for two days or so. I remember uh, around the Battle of Crete, uh, three highly modern destroyers, British destroyers, the name were Kashmi, Kashmir, Kelly, and Kandahar. A division of uh, mountain troops were shipped with nimble, nimble ships from Athens over to Crete. And there, these three destroyers had been active against this reinforcing flotilla. Uh, and then they were rounding Crete to the south and wanted to. Uh, to go back to their bases at Alexandria. But they were uh, found out by our reconnaissance planes and um, our group from the Peloponnesus in, in June 41 was starting south to catch these and find destroyers. And we met them and we dived down and we damaged the Kelly while the other ones, the Kandahar and the, and the Kashmir, were sunk under dramatic uh, conditions. The one had, had turned and was keel up, keel up was sinking, and the second one was breaking in the middle and sinking. While this sinking was done, we were already down and seeing this. And uh, later on we heard that they were commanded by Mountbatten. And the Kelly had uh, got uh, a hit but was yet uh, driving on. And they were assembling Mountbatten and others, survivors, and going to Alexandria. Uh, our our sea rescue squadron, which was flying and fishing uh, own people and also enemy out of the sea if necessary, <coughs> had not found Mount Betten and Mount Betten was rescued by Kelly <coughs> and went to Alexandria. And there he sat down and wrote a letter to his sister or some relative, I think a sister, who was Queen of Sweden then, and was writing that the dive bombers, when they had been f flying low, seeing the debacle of the sinking two destroyers, had been shooting on the, on the sailors who were flying there, uh, floating, floating there. And as far as my name is Mijo, it was a lie. So he obviously also used the weaponry of, uh, of lifeful propaganda against uh, his enemy. And this now seems to be established, and I had been come with this 20 years ago in, into a controversy with the Cape Times. Yes, the Cape Times had been reporting the version of Mountbatten, and I had been writing against. Our commander, Siegel, did the following while we were circulating down there. He slided open his, his roof, he unbuttoned 
the uh, the dinghy which we had on our back, which could be uh, could be had had a bottle of of uh, of, um, yeah. of air, and yeah, and uh, and pushed it out while opening the bottle. So the so the the dinghy uh, the little was flying out, yellow it was, and we were seeing it down to the British. And some of our pilots did the same thereafter, others not. Mm. That was done, yeah. but not shooting. <coughs> yeah, we, yeah we, we had an airport on the northern Peloponnesus, not far from fam famous Mykene. Uh, and from there we started our first missions onto Crete and onto the British Navy, which uh, instantly appeared. And uh, I remember a, a mission on a, a British f group with two cruisers and many, uh, many destroyers, and uh, they were in the north, operating in the north of, of Crete, and we had to attack them, which we did with some success. And when we landed, one of our sergeant, pilot, I heard him saying to a comrade after the debriefing, well, and when, I, when next I don't get the vision right on my cruiser, I will steer the plane down onto the cruiser. I heard this, and I said to him, Kretschmer, come to me. We are not making such things. We are needing you more than one time. Do, have you understood? Yes, Lieutenant. Have you really understood? Then he fell silent and didn't answer. It was two days later, again in the similar region, uh, with more British warships. We saw one plane was diving flatly onto the bow of a big warship, which later on sank. And when we reassembled, the position, position of, of Kretschmer was empty. He obviously had disobeyed. I don't know if he has asked his gunner for his consent to do this. So we had one man in our unit who did, did the Japanese jibaku. Back to, to Rodos in 41, in uh, July 41. <coughs> Our far, far reconnaissance plane had made out a ship which was running fast from east to west, a big freighter ship. Where did it come from? Where did it go to? What ship it was? And I was assigned with two other planes, my three, to attack it, it if necessary. So, well, our Reconnaissance plane wirelessed us on the line to the, to the place where the ship just was. It was south of Crete. <coughs> and there it was going along. And we three were diving. Out of the normal altitude of 3,000, we were diving onto that ship. It was a good ship of nearly 9,000 tons. And um, there also suddenly Red Cross on the ship. I also didn't believe it, but, man, we had to go out. Out! With a full load go, to go out. It was, it was heavy, but the wings were lasting, were strong enough. And the two, two others went onto a wide circle in some hundred meters, and I wanted to see that thing. And I was flowing flying low beside the ship and was see, seeing if there were some hidden guns or something like that. If so, then we would have 
as we said, tread underwater. Uh, but I couldn't find anything. And the captain must have had iron nerves. While we had been diving on him, he was not altering the course. He was going straight. Right. Well, so we couldn't do anything. We flew home with all our load. Reported to my old man, commander, and he said, you have done well. Uh, Red Cross, right or wrong, it, they would have made a propaganda point against us if we would have attacked that. One day later, we get a report, another reconnaissance plane was sighting this ship in Malta, and the ship was lying at a dock where normally war materials are unloaded. Ha! So obviously, <laughs> it was not so very much a Red Cross. Yeah. Nah, yeah. <coughs> Well, we had already uh, units who were fighting Malta and also the shipping around since the Italians, practically the Italians had joined the war against our will, by the way. Um, so they had to help the Italians. And we only had to do there in 42, in early 42. And there the British were, oh, not only 42, it was in August 42. The British were supplying Malta, resupplying Malta by a huge convoy. That was a convoy called Piedestal. Uh, uh, Malta had been bombed into a situation of no resistance anymore. They had no anti-aircraft uh, ammunition. They had no food, no water, no nothing. <coughs> uh, Malta was ripe that our parachute the Italians had two very good parachute divisions and also ours would jump on Malta but this was never done miraculously I can't, can, cannot, cannot explain this but in this situation the British sent their huge convoy Piedestal and Piedestal was consisting of two battleships Nelson and Rodney and m many uh, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, destroyers, and five air carriers. And in the middle, they protected uh, about 15 ships, freighters, and tankers. And we had the stiff order to attack, to, uh, to lay, uh, let aside all the warships, at least uh, in the first stage, and to concentrate on the freighters and especially the tankers. And we arrived over this armada, such a thing we never had seen before. And five, uh, four, four air carriers had remained. One had already been torpedoed by a submarine nearly Balears. That was an eagle. So we were a bit alleviated because these air carriers, they were, were, had fighters on board. And so we arrived. And we forgot the stiff order to concentrate on the freighters and tankers and saw a huge thing below us, a carrier. Must have been 35,000 tons. And went all onto this. We disregarded the order and we had all bombs, uh, special bombs for, carrier, for, for freighters, normal bombs, while for a uh, a warship, we should have been uh, armored car piercing bombs with heads or such heads. Uh, yeah, but nevertheless, the Indomitable was his name. It was put out of action as leaned aside and all the planes on the deck were falling into the sea. When we had done our dive, we were flying around and we were seeing that. Uh, and our commander later on had to go to Rome and to report to Kesselring, who was washing his head. And we thought he would not return to our unit, but he returned and told us how the old man had done it. <laughs> yeah. And we saw the Italians. I can tell you the value of the Italian soldier. Here he was brilliant. They had their torpedo planes. They had torpedo planes, Savoia Marchetti, three-engined, over-aged, 
The, the hull was canvas and the structure was partly wood and they went at lowest level over the waters in, the, in this uh, Peter style convoy, which was, uh, I would say the air was uh, concentrated with iron. There they went through and set that torpedo and jumped over the other ships through the whole convoy. And we saw it from our altitude burning here and splashing into the water and there again, but all the others went through and did their work. Uh, we, we were happy that we were only up there and we could die around and then out again. They had a different lot. Uh, Anti-aircraft of ships was, with ships, was devastating because they had a measuring basis larger than on land. It was a measuring base which was firm on the ship and they shot unfailingly even to altitudes. Well, roughly I have to say that we had to, to to part our missions, half-half roughly, on targets on sea and on targets on land. That means to fight against the, the British Navy and or to sustain our uh, parachutists. These parachutists, when they, after they had landed, they were in a, they were in a disadvantage yeah. because they were carrying only light weapons. The heaviest was a, a light mortar yeah. and this was not sufficient to counter the, uh, the Brit British but all, mainly New Zealander and Greek troops yeah. on the island which were fully armed with uh, artillery and even with light armored cars. But uh, parachutists, they made it and they held out in, in three points. In the west was Malemes, west of Kania, and then came uh, Retimon, and then came Kandia, Heraklion, in the center, the capital of the in island. And these three spots, they were sitting on the airports, but they couldn't branch out. They couldn't. Uh, they were pinned down and they had no force for a real offensive because they had nothing, no, uh, no reinforcement. And this reinforcement was then brought by the 5th Mountain Division. But how to bring over the 5th Mountain Division? We were no masters of the sea. These were the British. But we had the, we had the Italian Navy, which reluctantly helped a bit with light air, uh, with light naval ships only. And uh, we had Greek schooners and uh, fishing trawlers and such thing. And these we used to transport our mountain troops over to Crete, protected by some two Italian destroyers. And just in these main transport of this, uh, British light uh, naval forces from the west through the islands of Kitera and Antikitera broke through and we had a, a first alarm start on the British Navy in the early, early morning. No, I, couldn't, I wouldn't say that they had so much of anti-aircraft, only uh, infantry weapons, just guns yeah. and some machine guns, yeah. but no serious uh, real flak. Aircraft, nothing. No, no aircraft. We mastered the air, the British mastered the sea, and on the ground we slowly, very slowly uh, took the advantage. Uh, but targets on the ground were difficult to make out because there were orchards, little tiny orchards. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing was parted in a way to make it uh, un undeutlich, un undistinguishable. Uh, so it, but our parachutists and later on the, the, uh, the mountain troops, they put out signs where their forward, uh, forward units would be. Yeah. Uh, be it a swastika, a white one, mainly that. And then we knew there they were.
And so we had to search and to look for our enemy a little bit further. And then we saw it. But we didn't, first in our diving uh, altitude, from there you didn't see much yeah. of, of these targets. Yeah. You had to go down and make a strafing, real good old strafe. Oh, so then we, became, you know, we became more or less the strafing planes, ah, okay. yabos, yeah, more or less. There you also could lay a, a bomb. Yes, but then you had to put the bomb down with a um, Delay. delaying switch. Yeah. Otherwise, you would have been in the explosion uh, of, the, uh, of your own bomb. Yeah. Things are like that had happened. Yeah. The Greek civilian partisans, today some would call them terrorists. At least they were patriotic, highly cruel partisans. And they had a stronghold in the high mountains at the high valley of Omalon. Omalon lies a bit south of Kania and of Malemes. Well, there they were sitting and we, one time we tried to extirpate them there from this high valley. It was a high valley, maybe 1,000 meters high, rather circular, flat for acres or whatever they did there, but surrounded fully by high mountain peaks, sharp peaks all round about. It was a funny landscape. And this was, this was a stronghold of the partisans. And we flew there and we tried to see the installations or ditches or something like that. It was in vain. When you turned your fuselage and showed them your rear side. The bullets came with uh, tracers. You saw them two centimeters flying. When you turned back to shoot at the positions of these little guns, they were silent. You couldn't see them. They were sitting in the surrounding rockets. So all our, our mission, it was one or two missions to Omalon, were futile. So our troops led them aside and, so to say, uh, were hungering them away. Then later on they were not existing. But you could go out from this high valley of Omalon to the southern coast through a, a ravine, steep valley of, of, uh, of the mountains, down to sea level from 1,000 meters through the mountains. It was a a valley which was by far not straight. You had to, to make curves between the rock walls and then down you were at the sea. And that was our, our so to say, last Battle. pilot's joy to do that. Yeah, yeah. But up there at Mol Omalon, we couldn't do anything to the enemy. Yeah. That is a small terrorist against big weaponry. The small terrorist, when he have a good, a good coverage, he has always the upper hand. Yeah. Uh, ach ja, we were in Rodos, stationed in Rodos, and uh, the, in Syria, a fighting began between uh, the troops of General de Gaulle from the south, and in the north there was a, 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 a general of the French who was uh, under contract with us, our Vichy. Uh, Vichy. Yeah, the Vichy. At least. And French fighters from France were ferried over and came to help there, to land at Aleppo. Uh, and then they were making an interimistic landing and, and deep, deep evening in Rodos, where we were just stationed at our airport. While we were just seeing a film in the free with a big canvas, and this a film had the name The Campaign in France. So it was a report on our campaign in France. And then the French pilots who were flying a new French fighter, a Devoitine 500 and something, were nearing slowly and stood in, standing behind us. And I heard them speaking, yeah, so it was. Sorry, sorry, but so it was, this way.
And I must say, we should have made contact with them. And in this evening, gone out to some tavern with them. We were much too haughty to speak to them. And that was totally wrong. Yeah. In the early, in the early November of 1941, we barely had arrived at uh, uh, Eterna, North Africa, and didn't stay long there, and were transferred to the southeast of Derna, where the airport, Italian established airport, I must say, was lying with the name of Martuba. It was a rather big airport with uh, and totally circular. We flew to there, uh, but the airport had not yet been fully supplied. There was petrol, but there were no bombs. And uh, when we would be starting to there, we had no fighter cover. We didn't know where from to take it, to have it. Uh, uh, after a short while, a column carrying bombs of, of uh, lorries arrived slowly, slowly, which must dust trailing behind it, and came to the airport. And uh, the inspector who was leading it, a Luftwaffe inspector, uh, was reporting to our, our commander Siegel. And uh, Siegel was saying, and now you go first, you go quickly, immediately to the machine so that the bombs can be quickly loaded, because we have to start to Tobruk very, probably very soon. But the leader of the column, the inspector said, uh, said, uh, Oberstleutnant, we cannot do it. First, we have to register the bombs on the bomb storing place. Yes. And then I see my commander unbuttoning his holder of his pistol, and saying, if you are not immediately going with the machines, I will shoot. Thereupon, <laughs> the inspector obeyed, and we had our bombs soon under the machines. Yes. Now about fighter cover. We had not yet our fi seen our fighter cover, and we had, not, uh, we had the order to fly onto the ships in the harbor of Tobruk, but the time was not yet given. Suddenly a group, the second group of the Jagdgeschwader 27 arrives. Commander Hauptmann Lippert. As I said, the airport was circular and Lippert had placed his machines opposite each other, I would say, in a triangle way, opposite each other. And this was a good foresight, foreseeing, uh, because it didn't last long. British fighter bombers arrived from afar and wanted, obviously, to stifle our attack on Tobruk by bombing, bombing Martuba and our fighters had to go out instantly and quickly. And they took off, starting each squadron, so to say, against each other. They were not full, these squadrons, six machines each or eight machines, standing in a line, and these lines were going against each other, one very low, or one medium, one higher up. Mm -hmm. And so they avoided the trails of dust, mm -hmm. waste of time, and were instantly in the air, in a formation, and up to the enemy. This you could do only with seasoned pilots. And it needs a lot of nerves to start, so to say, against each other. <laughs> albeit in different altitudes. Yeah. <clears throat> we arrived at Derna, Derna Airport, and uh, as we now know, the British had, uh, had opened up our code, uh, military code, and they also, they could 
follow many, many orders. So they knew that uh, our group was flying over on a certain day and arriving in an evening at Derna. And there was an Italian garrison and we were guests there and we had a huge, huge house built in the, in the Italian colonial style, very, very solid. You thought you were with the old Romans. And, uh, well, there was a big meal. And suddenly, we, <laughs> our field mail had already, they were functioning very well, already I found a letter of my fiancé, here, my wife, there. And I said, before we were going to, to the table, I sat there and just wanted to open it, and then we heard an awful bang to the side of our house, and the house was really shaking. A British bomber had set a bomb, which was, how should I say, a bomb with a little fuse hanging out. And so the bomb was exploding in a certain uh, altitude, say f three, four meters, and just to the side of our house. And the house was really shaking. Thereupon, we saw Italians and our own comrades, the big staircase, a wonderful staircase, uh, head, uh, rushing down, jumping over the street. There was an, an air shelter, a ditch or what are covered, yeah. And while I also was walk, uh, running down together with my comrade, Martin, Martin kicked me in the side and said, Heinz, let the idiots run to their shelter. We go back upstairs and we start to dine, <laughs> which we did. We had some candles, the electricity was out. We had some candles and we were nicely eating. And then the, a real bombing started. So a line, a chain of bombs, bomb, 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 bomb. And we thought, ah, it's unpleasant. I think we just also go down to those. And when we were down and in the big gate, my marble, I mean, it was fast. Such a chain of bombs was coming. One. One, the next, should have been at us. And I hear my f friend Martin saying, Heinz, damned, now the, now the punishment comes. <laughs> but it didn't come, it was over and so forth. <laughs> yeah, we had proper, proper, proper targets. But uh, it was effective, but it was difficult for the Stuka to support the army because these were all nimble targets, uh, which were difficult to make out. Uh, say, um, a concentration of, of tanks, of British tanks, well, they were not standing close by, close to each other so that we could smash them. They had to be uh, taken singly, I would say. And that is no proper target for a dive bomber. A dive bomber has to have targets like massive targets, like a bridge or a factory or a, a ship. A ship was our, our best target, most liked. And this we don't, didn't have in the desert. In the desert, desert, we really had to seek our little, little fishes. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the, uh, the army was uh, very thankful when our bombs in front of them uh, into the English uh, positions fell. As far I remember, uh, the British were not, uh, for instance, at Alamein, dug in in trenches like, in, in running trenches like in the First World War. Uh, they had small positions like small fortifications, dugouts, and these we had to crack. And these were, were occupied, say, by uh, 12 men or 5 men or so. <coughs> and these we had to seek out 
and to find out in the desert. Seldomly had we had we uh, uh, reconnaissance planes who were bringing us pictures of these things. So very when seldom. the last British covering ships, warships, after this action of the Peterstal, went back to Britain, fast cruisers and and uh, and destroyers, uh, and close under the Algerian coast. Well, we got them at last, and we made a successful attack, but I got a splinter through my wing, and 150 liters, where well, there's a tank, also an auxiliary tank there and there, was flowing out, and it lacked, uh, so I couldn't go home. I was far away, I wasn't in the Algerian coast. And so I had to look out for any landing ground uh, in French, Algeria, which I found. It was a little town at Philippeville, and there was, a, was an airport, and there I landed. All right, the French were under a special treaty with us, uh, armistice, and so also there in Algeria, and as uh, up came on a little car uh, a captain who introduced himself and he spoke a fluent German. He was obviously from Alsace, one of the uh, Germans. And I said to him, please fill up my plane. Only that one tank you need not. Oh, no, monsieur, he said, that's not possible. Uh, we have to wireless or telephone to Wiesbaden where the permanent uh, Armistice Commission is sitting and you are sitting at our at our petrol uh, tap and uh, everything what we are filling in to you we have to have the, the permission from Wiesbaden that we get it re, re, replaced until we don't have the, the, the yes we cannot fill in okay. Oh, the man. And how long will this take? No, yeah, more than a day, he said. Yeah, no. But I have to introduce you to the commander of the, of the garrison here. So we drove, and my gunner also, we drove into town, and there were splendid French colonial uh, barracks with, with iron rod windows and door and gutters which opened and tiles on the floor, beautiful, beautiful. And there I was standing with my gunner and with that captain, and from far away from his uh, room, a colonel came with long boots and with spurs and with a pince nez on his, <laughs> on his eyes and white sleeves and a capi. He was a typical French officer. So he came, clear, 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 clear. And then the captain introduced me to that colonel. And now I thought he would at least give me the hand and ask something. Nothing. His eyes were blinkering on me for half a minute. Didn't give my hand. And then he turned and went away, clear, 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 clear. And the poor captain said, oh man, Domar, he cannot forget Alsace. Oh. I said, we also have not forgotten that old German piece. Yeah. <laughs> and there we were sitting then for more than 30 hours. Yeah. And we got a room uh, in, in a hospital, and that hospital was high on the, on the seaside. And uh, there doctors came and they said have you given it to them to the English because they were all full of fury because the English had uh, sank their, f their fleet in Oran that's not forget forgot have you given it to them oh I thought I think so yes and um, where are you where had you have your Italians also been with you and I was beginning a bit cumbersome and was saying in my French, yes, uh, they were not at this mission, but, 
And when I had said this, they said, yes, yes, they were not in this mission and you will never see them. We congratulate you to your splendid uh, allies <laughs> and laughed. No, it was not difficult. Well, we were operating mainly near the coast and there we saw the formations of the coast. And then we knew certain very distinct wadis, peren perennial uh, river sides. And that was enough. And that was the street, the Via Balbia, which was, was run, running near the coast, that also served us as, as a helpful mark. Yeah. Others, no. Then we had the steep embankment between Libya and, uh, and Egypt, the Al Faya Pass, and the El Alamein front itself served already as a sort of a landmark because it was a sort of a geographical, ge geological pass yeah. between sea and deep depression. I was going out with my plane from Trapani. It was a runway of uh, uh, asphalted runway, wonderful. But it was slightly upwards. And we started this way because of some wind against us. So at least we had this way. And at the end of the runway was standing a hangar with open doors yawning at us. A hangar, yeah. And my plane, it was a Dora, a strong one, new one, was not coming aerodynamically on his stick for a takeoff. It wasn't coming. Yeah, yeah. Damned. And then the hangar came nearer and I pulled with some silly force and then it lifted reluctantly while it was hitting with the spawn. We had a three, three point landing with the spawn, the ground, bang. Uh, it came, it came just above the roof of the damned hangar and then I wanted to uh, bring the flaps in. The flaps for starting had been out a bit, for landing out even more, but for starting I wanted to, to give them in. The flaps were at all were not, were not adjusted. It was in flight position. So my mechanic hadn't controlled, I had not controlled. It was all speed, speed, speed. So I could have landed, landed in the hangar. And then my, some of my comrades said, oh, doesn't matter, it's an Italian hangar. You would have come, come in and out at the other end. <laughs> Nonsense. Yeah, yeah. So you, before you take off, you check everything. You have to. And, uh, also, you have to, to, to check your loading, is it the right loading? And so you have to, theoretically, but we have had not much time very often yeah. before starting. Yeah. Go out, go out. Yeah. Uh, Walter Siegel, he came from Augsburg, he was an outstanding man. And he was also personally, he was. But in the field, I had a special line of, of contact with him. He liked me, but he had found, had many, had several critical points seen in me, and these he expressed very um, distinctly. When I came to the group, he was already a major, uh, colonel major. And then he became a colonel. He uh, gave me always smaller units uh, to command. For instance, there were British ships, warships, a uh, heavy cruiser amongst them. <coughs> they were mauled while they were shooting at <coughs> Tobruk, which we held by us, by our <coughs> coastal artillery, especially by the Flak 8-8. <laughs> and retreated on the sea and and then he assigned me to catch these ships to fly out. Jo take 12 machines and go out. And always he assigned me such little t uh, autonomous tasks. So he wanted, obviously, he wanted to build me up as a, as a leader of uh, bigger units later on. Yeah, I had, um, I was, had been assigned in Piacenza to our training squadron there 
and uh, we had to fly over to Munich to fetch new machines. It was just at Easter 1942. And uh, well, I led several crews to Munich in a plane where we had to receive new ones. <coughs> and then Easter at Munich, I had nobody at Munich. I said to my men, <coughs> you enjoy Easter at Munich. I fly a bit further on to Nuremberg where my fiancé and his, her family live. And then we meet again after Easter in Munich and fly back to Piacenza. But I had no flight order from Munich to Nuremberg. So I flew on my own. Fine. Spent Easter. And then when I came to the airport to fly back to Munich and so on, um, there was a sergeant asking me, uh, Lieutenant, your flight order. I said, <coughs> Back to Munich, I have none. It's on my own. I have enough <laughs> petrol in the plane. Don't mind. He said, jawohl. But behind my back, he sat down and he wrote a report. And when I was back at Piacenza, the, the commanding officer said, my God, we have in copy, we have the, the report on you. We cannot do anything. We cannot hold it in... in uh, in original, it's already with the military court. <coughs> no, yeah, he said, when you will be going back to Africa, to your old group, then the matter will be lost in the air somehow. It was not. I reported back to my commander, and he said the following, I have yet his words. Find that we have you back, Michaud, in Africa. And then he boiled a bit up and he looked at me st stiffly and said, it is always the same with you, Mijo. When we have a pot of honey here and a pot of shit there, you step into the shit. And with his fist on the table. And then he calmed down and said, all right, you take the second squadron and we will soon be taking Tobruk. And it was a shower, cold, hot, hot, cold. <coughs> so he was. And then we took Tobruk and made our big advancement towards Egypt and wanted to, to take Egypt, but we were halted at El Alamein. There was a geographical narrow uh, um, strip. And there the retreating, fast retreating British could make a stand. And we arrived there with, uh, with nimble armed forces. I think our panzers were, had dwindled down to 20 and something. On the long road of more than 1,000 kilometers, they were lying back with chain trouble, motor trouble, all these sort of things. So, Active ones were not enough to break through at El Alamein. And uh, the, the military court admonished the co our commander about uh, the report of, of, of Lieutenant Mijot. He, sh he should be heard. I should be heard. And our commander always at answered back, uh, we cannot do anything. All papers are with... Uh, transport, the rear transport. So, uh, all right. And then we were halted at El Alamein and after a long, long while, he had me come and then said, Mijo, it's awful, this trouble with you. What are we doing? The court is now setting us a short time. Now we cannot evade anymore. Everything, well, Transport is with us, all papers are with us. Uh, what are we doing? And I'm seeing him yet uh, grasping his chin and then stroke out his f finger and said, I have it. You disappear in the oasis of Siva, far down in the south, uh, for three days and we will report you missed. And after three days you are coming back and the matter is over. 
I, I was already very joyful to reside at Siva, deep in the south, a very picturesque old oasis with a long history. But then Montgomery attacked, and so I could not go to, to Siva. And so was our commander. The ground crews were, were, uh, were part of our units, squadrons, groups, and so they were under us. For instance, my machine had two uh, men, the ground crews, one first mechanic and second mechanic. And so all machines had the same. And we were really befriended with them. You will later, I could later on show you a picture uh, of us with the mechanics under the wings of my plane. Um, and several ones of them were highly trained specialists. Who, for instance, were for, for instance, for uh, propellers, for automatic readjustment of the propellers. I mean, that is, uh, not every mechanic c can master this. Then the injection pumps. When you have a 12-cylinder motor, you have a, a batch of an injection pumps. And uh, they were not just replaced when they were outworn, these men were repairing them. Uh, the long pump uh, for 12 cylinders, uh, you has, have uh, uh, 24 little pumps, and these they had to, to clean out or to, uh, and to also to, what is Schleifen? Yeah, yeah. And this under, under, under adverse uh, ground conditions, say sandstorms and so, which they did and achieved. These were specialists assigned to every group, a group of, of specialists who did it for all the planes of the group, these special things, while the general things were done by the first and second mechanics. In, uh, after the Battle of Crete, our group was lying at Rhodos, at the island of Rhodos, near the town of Rhodos. There was a real airport. And, um, yeah, and this uh, so called Dodecanese with other islands, there was Samos, was also belonging to it, was part of the Italian Empire. They had taken it in 1912 from, from the Turks. So we were on the island of our allies. And we had a gunner, not in my squadron, it was in another one, the first squadron. He came from Styria and he was an academic. He was, uh, as we say, a learned house. And he knew Italian. And he walked at the main piazza of Rodos, very picturesque in its architecture, old. He walked past a group of Italian officers and he gave his orderly salute to these officers. But there, no hand moved. They didn't answer his salute. So my dear, and he was an ensign. The, my dear ensign got an inner fury and he made a big loop and passed again the Italians and again showed his honor to them and they again did not <laughs> answer. Thereupon he stepped forward to them and said to them, gentlemen, to you it is a great honor to be saluted by a German ensign. Thereupon some moved their hands a bit, others not. And the matter was reported to the governor and our commander Siegel had to uh, was ich melden. So. 
Ja, Traudel, vielen Dank. Had to report to the governor. <coughs> And there, as later on Siegel told us in a uh, small circle, he said, to this governor I had to explain the right also of the common soldier in Germany. He had his rights in his honor. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. With the Italians, it was not. Can you remember the name of that governor? Yeah, Tadieu, and that is a French name. How this French name came to Styria, to the Catholic country, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Tadieu, D-A-D-E, if you want to take note of yeah. it. Uh, in Styria there will be some Tadieu from Graz. Uh, yeah, from, was, should be from Graz. Yeah, I was seeing the Italian several times in action. But our cooperation was not good because we had no um, wireless together, frequencies. So we saw them and we knew that they were also there when we had, uh, when we had the order for a mission. We naturally everything was touched, the enemy side and our side and on our side there would probably be said and Italian fighters probably will support. Then you saw them somewhere. But when I saw them in action, uh, they were exact and good. Firstly, they were good pilots. I would say they were endowed and as a pilot, the Italians. And then these airmen, these Italian airmen, uh, very generally speaking, they are a brave lot. And another example is the Italian torpedo flyers who attacked British convoys. What I saw there when the Italians were attacking with, with old-fashioned Savoia Marchetti, the, the, the triple-engined planes built of uh, wooden structures, partly canvas, and not very speedy. Now going low level, deeply over the waves into the convoys, where the air was very iron holding. Uh, they went on and went on, and many, many fell in these attacks, which we could see from above. I would say the fighters and the torpedo flyers, they were two outstanding standing sorts of units with the Italians. I know him very closely. I mean, the fighters and we, we were, so to say, married. And so we visited him several times in his airport. And he was a man full of art, typical artist. He was not a very military stiff person, not at all. Uh, and he had a little bar and he was uh, playing on his gramophone the last rumba and, and he had a Negro. He was a, a South African uh, kept, uh, captured soldier, a Zulu. He was his, his mixer and all and men and he helped him and he was, this man was very happy there. Uh, and um, Marseille had, was already flying in the Battle of Britain, but was not successful at all. They made forced landings in, um, on the German side, shot, shot up very badly by the British. And uh, then he began, obviously, to sink. And in Greece and in North Africa, there his star rose up. For instance, for our fighters, it was forbidden to go into the defense circle when British fighters who were slower, uh, like hurricanes, were, uh, um, so to say, arrested by, by 109s and were making their circle. It was forbidden to go into that circle to shoot one out because another hurricane might have shot at the 109. Um, but he, he developed uh, a procedure 
how he could make it, how he could cut, cut out one hurricane. Later on, in one approach, he was able to cut out two. And then the ring was open, and then the rest could be breakfasted by the others. So then his, uh, his star slowly rose up, and his, his uh, upper commander, wing commander, was a very understanding man. And he let him go. He said to him, when you really think you can make it, then you are permitted to continue. And he was once, well, in the morning, in the very morning, very early, uh, the fighters sent one plane up uh, to test the weather or what and uh, plane was going up. It was a routine matter, mostly uh, done by a corporal or a sergeant, but his group commander, who was a very stiff Prussian, a good fighter also, in Marseille, they couldn't understand each other. Marseille led a, a staffel, a squadron, and his wing commander. And his wing commander sent just the Staffelführer, Marseille, for this morning enterprise. And Marseille was fuming. He was coming back in the morning at 7 or well, 6.30, and he was flying over the tent of his commander, who might have been just shaving, and he was hitting two two centimeter grenades into the sand behind the tent. Rum, rum. Now, <laughs> now the, the, uh, the wing commander <laughs> was asked to regulate that matter. Normally, uh, that would, uh, would have been a case for the, for the, um, for the war court. And, uh, well, separately, he had asked the two one to, to, to speak to him intimately, and so it was. He gave them his, his special warning to the commander and to also to Marseille, and so the matter stayed. That was never made public. The, the old wing commander after the war told me about this. Marseille had, as far as I know, uh, was shooting up uh, 158 uh, planes, and these were mostly or nearly all English, and that gives the matter a special quality because the English were very difficult to get. Russians was another chapter. But British was, was uh, so, and uh, experts in the German Luftwaffe say that obviously from the part of endowment, uh, uh, Marseille was the most endowed fighter which we had. If he would have lived on, he might have gone elsewhere with his, with his, uh, yeah, we were just, seeing him really in a circle of hours in Bari in August, yeah, early August 1942. He had been, got his highest uh, uh, medal to be handed by, directly by Adolf Hitler and he had, he had to fly up to uh, Eastern Prussia to the so-called Wolfschanze, which was the headquarters. And there, after uh, his medal was put on him, uh, Adolf Hitler bade him to, for a tea, and together where Hermann Göring was also sitting there, and uh, the Luftwaffe adjutant, Oberst von Belo, of Adolf Hitler was present. And Hitler asked him and asked him about the uh, air situation in North Africa, and he was speaking freely as he would have spoken to his wing commander. He also said that uh, we are yet slightly superior 
in uh, not in numbers but in in uh, plain uh, quality but uh, there were news that the British were bringing out a new type of, of uh, Spitfire and uh, this would, uh, would make the matter very difficult and he suggests that something would be done, should be done. All noted by the adjutant von Belo and Adolf was asking again and again and again. Göring was saying no word. And then the matter was over and then Göring took him. And he made a real, as we say, he made a, a mesh out of him. He pressed him into one corner and he was shouting him down. He said, when you are saying such things to the Führer, which only I can say to him, then I will do the little what to do, what to do to you. Now, yeah, and this he was telling us, just clearly fresh from the source. And there we were very astonished. Our jaw was a bit opening that Adolf Hitler was shielded off from unpleasant news. Yeah, but then began, we were together, four of us. Marseille, Mostov, Schiller, Mijot. And of these four, only Mijot, myself, is living yet. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, there began a, a highly interesting evening. <laughs> we, for instance, between the hotels in Bari at the Kaisai, there were, was a, a monument standing, yet in linen, sack linen. And I had been asking in Italian, why this, at this beautiful place, why this, at this beautiful place, the uh, monument is not uh, unveiled. He said, ah, that, is, that was the cultural minister so and so from the First World War and he didn't like the Germans, so we don't, uh, don't in unveil him. And when we passed this thing in the night at one, I said, men, Marseille, are you agreeing we are pulling the sack down and we are unveiling the beautiful men? Which we did at night, <laughs> in the night at one. <laughs> no, no, he had his fiancy. He was allowed to come with, go with his fiancy down to Rome, so spend also some days there. Rome was was uh, normally barred to to any soldiers, only those staffs who had to work there, Kesselring and his people, but others not. But he got the, the, the permission, the special permission. Yeah, and when he came back and saw us, and he was a bit uh, tired looking. <laughs> and I was saying to him, <laughs> Marseille, was, has a lady been good? He jumped nearly on me and said, what? This is my fiancy. I forbid you to tell such matter. <laughs> All right, fiancy. <laughs> and then we started our round, our evening there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Firstly, the Luftwaffe was not under Rommel, it was on, on an equal footing, and as we said, it was, it was uh, assigned on cooperation with the army. And Rommel uh, was a superior of the army in North Africa, and we had a Fliegerführer in North Africa, and his uh, superior was Kesselring. General Oberst Kesselring in Rome. And he was on an equal footing with Rommel, here army, the Luftwaffe. Rommel we saw very seldom. The army, he never came to our airports. I was once seeing him closely when we were, shortly before we took uh, Tobruk in July in, uh, 1942 on the airport of El Adem. There they were all together and there I came with my commander and there I was even introduced to Rommel, but he certainly forgot me, high commander and little lieutenant. <coughs> we knew that he was a superior soldier already in the First World War. 
that we knew and from there we took our judgment. And then we knew that he spelled a special role in France in so far as he was uh, by his by his dashing towards the uh, channel was separating the British from the French, roughly to say. And that was a big advantage to us. Uh, Rudel, against his will, was assigned to the reconnaissance, uh, close reconnaissance plane, not far reconnaissance, close reconnaissance plane, which helped the army. But on his will and wish was transferred to the dive bombers and he came to us after we had flown uh, towards Britain and so there was factually nothing. And we exercised and exercised, we, threw, uh, we were flying in close formation for instance uh, through the clouds, the whole, the whole formation close together so that we could see each other. And, and Rudel was falling out. He proved an uh, insufficient pilot. But on the other hand, he was a very sportive man. He opened the ice in, in winter to, to, to bathe in the ice. He was highly sportive. I think he drank no alcohol, only milk and uh, French ladies he disregarded. I mean, and also as a comrade he was very far away. Funny man. And then because of his flying insufficiency he was sent to a Stucker school in, uh, in Germany to um, retrain him or to see if he was fit at all to retrain him. And it lasted a long time. And while we were already flying against Crete from a southern Peloponnese airport, there he suddenly reported uh, to our commander. And there I hear the fatal words of our commander who seldomly made a mistake, but then he made a mistake and said, Rudel, with me you get no plane. There he stood. And I saw him last when we went out in another morning, uh, at four o'clock in the morning, on, onto some British ships. Uh, and he was standing and was looking after us with a stiff face. And then it didn't last long and the F Russian campaign had begun and we suddenly heard the name of Rudel. And we said, our Rudel? No, that he cannot be. He was it. He had been transferring planes to the front in uh, near Leningrad and there was an understanding commander who said, Rudel, don't ferry planes anymore, stay with me show what you can if you have been trained well and then you stay, can stay in my, my unit. It'll be, I will make the things. And he stayed there and he, a sheer will, he had taken himself together and I think it was the first mission or the second mission. He was sinking the big battleship Marat, uh, 35, 32, 32,000 uh, tons. And then it went on and on and on and on. From then on, from then on, he was, yeah, it was more than 500 tanks which he got. He was shooting himself down fighters, Russian fighters, I think 25 or so. As an enigma. So he had, he had totally changed himself as a pilot. As a man, he was always a bit uh, difficult. Yeah. But good chaps need not necessarily to be, to, to be amiable. Yeah. In the summer of 38, when we volunteers from the army were all assembled at Neubiberg to learn flying from the scratch, there I also met uh, Günther Rall. Günther Rall had been coming from uh, 
from an infantry regiment near Stuttgart and I from the light field artillery and we became real good friends. And we were together the whole time in Neubiberg, uh, one and a half months, and also later in uh, Schleisheim. And then we together came to the fighter school to Verneuchen. And there our ways parted. He stayed a fighter and became a very famous and successful fighter, and I went to the dive bombers. And then we lost each other in the, during the war. We didn't see each other. Only after the war, I found out that he had uh, stayed alive, and I saw him. I saw him two times, and we corresponded by letters together. But we didn't see eye to eyes in political matters. He was rejoining the Bundeswehr as a volunteer, and I refused. This had our political reasons. And he was leaning very much to the dear Americans, and I did not. So these were our slight differences. But no enmity therefore, but we just didn't see it thereafter anymore. And, uh, but we continued to exchange letters. And his la in his last letter, which was probably arriving here I think in 1908, yeah, just a bit, be, a bit before his death. There he was writing to me a sentence uh, which showed that he, he, had, he, become, he had become doubtful. I now don't understand the Americans anymore. Well, he was a typical man of an excellent soldier. He had 280 uh, fighters and other planes shot down, but of a man with limited insight in political matters and also historical matters. Did he visit you here in South Africa? No, he didn't see me. Okay. He, he had made he had made a visit here, but on invitation of uh, I think of the South African military then in 1980 something. And there resulted the uh, so-called Ral scandal, because he, in his position as an inspector of the Bundesluftwaffe, uh, was making a private visit to that defamed South Africa. If not, the press would have sniffed out the matter. And then the press hang it up, and then he was deposed from his post as an inspector of the Luftwaffe. They even wanted to to take his pension rights away, but this last one was not done. Yeah, yeah. And so he was in an, in an early pension. Yeah. Mm. Uh. yeah, there is a happy story about a special food which were, was uh, <laughs> given to the troops again and again and too much at nauseam. Uh, to the troops. That was an Italian preserve, or conserve, how do you say, conserve, uh, of, say, one kilo. Uh, it was a goulash, a very good goulash, and it had stamped on the top of the, of the lid, it was stamped on A full stop, M full stop, which meant Alimentazione Militare. Military proviance. Provia, proviance, yes, all right. Well, and we were happy with this, but uh, supply from, uh, from the continent of, uh, of food also and of ammunition and of many things was severed permanently by the British for Malta, submarines and, uh, and also fighters. So we sometimes had too much of this good goulash. Again goulash, and again this goulash. Well, and so the soldier is uh, saving himself by a good humor uh, when things be, uh, be, become uh, overdone. And so they made, the soldier made out of the AM, made in German, Altermann, old man. A.M. 
a humorless quartermaster of the staff of Rommel, he issued after a, uh, uh, an order forthwith not to uh, use the word Altaman. He wanted to so forbid it. Thereafter, this this term, <coughs> thereafter this term, was established in the whole Africa Corps and Africa Luftwaffe. I think even Rommel might have used it sometimes. Okay. He was not without humor. <laughs> in our wing number three, Stuka three, uh, we had also the second group. And the second group's commander was transferred, I don't know why and where to, and uh, an officer from the Luftwaffe general staff, Major Sorge, appeared to take over the uh, the group and yeah well he was able to fly he was also had also obviously Stuka training but he never had been leading a, a unit in the air and at the first mission he flew so difficult so that the group fell apart how should I give a good picture that when, when the, for instance, when the commander at the front of the group of say 25 machines suddenly goes into a steep le left hand curve, what the others are doing? They cannot follow so quickly. A unit, <coughs> when it changes direction, can do it uh, in other ways, <coughs> but not in, uh, not through the commander suddenly changing direction. Impossible. The group saved, so to say, itself. They all came back, and the eldest squadron leader, Hauptmann or Oberleutnant, then, Ober I think Oberleutnant Kuhlmai, <coughs> from Eastern Prussia, a stiff man, a courageous man, uh, stepped to Major Sorge and said, Herr Major, well, from now on, in the air, I will be leading the group, while you can lead the group on the ground in all respects. Mm. And Sorge was wise enough to do this, to accept, and uh, to fly in the rear ranks in the air uh, with the squadron while Kulmai took the lead in the, in the air, yes. I remember an attack on Tobruk, ships in the long, long bay of Tobruk, there were ships, uh, well, and uh, yeah, then I had yet, no, I was not yet a squadron leader. My three planes, <coughs> in fact, uh, we were only two, went down on, everybody was an, assigned a different ship. Well, the whole group went down. And we had a ship, I, yeah, with my two planes, we had a ship. And when I came nearer, I saw a red cross on the bow and on the rear, damped. Then you have to decide. We had doubts with the British and the use or misuse of the red cross. Red Cross or no, you had to pull out a dump. <laughs> pull out. <laughs> In your target. And the yeah. group flew away, and I was also left alone. Thanks God, two Messerschmitts stayed with me, and I went out, out of the, to the sea where the British good anti aircraft from Tobol, Captain Fine anti aircraft, was not reaching to, and then I gained altitude again and then I set my bomb to a ship which was to the side of this Red Cross ship, close to the side and there I, I, I bombed it with full effect and then when I was flying home I was thinking ah, yeah, uh, parts of my target has flo have flown all over to the damned Red Cross, <laughs> so that you also got something. <laughs> yeah. We had a 
paper issued then in, 19, in the 40s at Athens uh, called Der Adler von Hellas, the Eagle of Hellas. And uh, the journalists there also had military ranks, some special ranks, and one of them came over to North Africa and uh, interviewed our commander. Oberstleutnant Siegel, Walter Siegel. And then he wrote an article in the Adler of Hellas, and there you could read, the commander says, when I'm sitting at the stick of my plane, I'm forgetting wife and child. Well, that was printed in the paper. This paper was read by the troops in the Balkans, in North Africa, I think even by the English sometimes, and uh, here and there in the, in the Heimat. And then there came a letter from the wife of Walter Siegel, a letter mildly inquiring. And I know my commander Siegel. He never, never would have spoken such uh, nonsensical words. So this journalist who had written the nonsense was not cautious enough, he visited again North Africa and saw our commander Walter Siegel. And I was just present, so to say, around the corner in another room when I heard how Siegel received this uh, journalist. And <laughs> he, he took the journalist, as we say, <coughs> apart in pieces in a way which I personally liked very much because I had no, lost no love with journalists also then in the war. Uh, well, that was the 7th Armour Division. And uh, instantly I was led to the command car. It was uh, like an like a, a office on four wheels. And I was led into, and there were two staff officers, and they began to ask painful questions to me. And I said to the gentleman, I cannot answer these. You also wouldn't do it. Here is my, my gray uh, paper, it was in Grau Ausweis, um, personal paper. Uh, yeah, a little, oh, a little thing. Uh, this shows everything I can say, my name, my confession, my birth date, my rank. They looked at me, they closed a folder a bit uh, disappointedly and said, all right, and then I had to go. So I stepped a little ladder down and there stood a lot of, of soldiery around me and near me and they spoke in English which I totally could not understand. I think it was London East or so, wild men. <coughs> And I thought they wanted to hit me. No, they didn't want to hit me. They just wanted to ask me questions. And they asked me what Adolf Hitler was doing in Germany, uh, good things to the common man. Well, so I started to pontificate. <laughs> but suddenly we were separated. That should not be. So, and then I was assigned to a little jeep. I was sitting between two military police chaps. And always we went along, moving ahead of, behind Rommel. Now, and they wanted to take a photo from me. And I said, no, no, no photo in, photo in prisoner of warship. But look, we have talked so much, we are near friends, why not? Then came an idea, I said, all right, when you promise me, when you promise me, you will send um, a copy of this photo then <coughs> to my fiancé. I gave the address, it might go via Portugal, Switzerland, and then you will, she will receive it. All right, we will do this. <coughs> well. Later on, uh, 
I was released from British prisoner of warship in, uh, in the middle of 1947 only. Uh, no picture was there. 14 days I was there in her house. This picture arrived. And the soldier was writing, yeah, he excused, uh, apologized himself. <clears throat> he had been at Burma the whole time and there and there and the negative was lying with his mom in London and now he is back and now he makes a copy and here it is. Oh, good man. I have it I have it yet with me. I can show it to you. And then I tried to escape uh, in the in the night with a, with the lorry. And they had no car key, it was Chevrolet. They had only a, a button which you could pull and so you could start the motor. It was deep in the night, the motor had been, become cold and when it suddenly, suddenly gave uh, ignition, <laughs> the chaps were up, <laughs> out of their sleeping bags with a gun, come on. So I had to come on again, but I, I remained a well-watched guest, that was it. And the following night we were sitting around a campfire, everybody warming its tins with a long twig stick. And um, suddenly a young captain sits in the round, sits aside me and starts abruptly to talk and said, Hey Jerry, are we mad? I've yet his word. I didn't, I didn't know what he was up for. I didn't speak a word. He came closer and said, are we mad, I say, to fight each other here in this bloody desert? Uh, I said, yeah, that's right. Then he said, don't you know, we together could have pocketed the world. <laughs> well, the good British imperialists, together with the Germans, they to do, do the work a bit. Why not? <clears throat> Yeah, then I said to him, but, but you see, Adolf Hitler had made so many suggestions to England. They were all turned down. And he threw up, we were sitting on the ground, he threw up his legs and his arms and cried loudly, uh, never with him. <coughs> so I said, yeah, but you never try. Make a try and you will find out how it functions. Do it. Fell silent, didn't say a word, stood up and went back into the dark to his company. But so was the sentiment of the Britishers then towards the Germans. At the end of the war, as I later knew, it was um, by propaganda, 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 it had been turned away from that fair attitude. Now, yeah, we were then uh, assigned to be transported back to Cairo, to first Alexandria and to Cairo, and we had um, a little rallying point and there were uh, oh, 12 captured officers we were and some others, and it was dark and it had rained and it was, as I was told, it was immediately south of Tobruk. So we were already with that division gone so far. And um, while we were there, out of the dark came a man. He was a colored or was a South African or what. And he carried a bottle in his hand and he wanted to go into our circle, into to us and give us a good drink and uh, cried in German a bit, mein Lieber, mein Mann, my dear, my man, and Britishers were holding him out, and so he circled with his bottle, himself a bit drunk, uh, be, uh, he was, mein Lieber, mein Mann, mein Lieber, mein Mann, and then he disappeared into the dark, and it didn't take long. He came back out of the dark, had a long flashing thing in his hand, I don't know what, bayonet or so, 
and wanted to come into our circle and killed loudly and uh, cried loudly, kill them, kill them. And the Britishers again held him away. And then he was also circling again, kill them, kill them. Yeah, and then we went uh, back to Alexandria and Alexandria we got a, a spectacle where it amused us a bit. There were the Egyptians standing, leaned at the pillars in their long gowns like pyjamas and eating a peanuts and so. And we had a, a British soldier. We were also a line of 12 officers or what. And our soldier here and, and, and at the end, and they had their guns. And these Britishers, that the one in the front, started to mishandle the Egyptians, the civilians who were standing there, uh, pushing their hands so that the nuts were flying away, and then the, the button of the gun into the belly. I, I saw the eyes of the Egyptians around, and I said to myself, go on, dear Britishers, this way, go on. Then we were on the train to Cairo. Speed train, compartments, and a gang on the left side. And I had to, um, I had to go to the loo. And the soldier followed me until I was there. But there were also civilians in the compartments. And suddenly, I had to push into my palm of my hand. And that was a paper. I closed it. And on the loo, I was opening it, and that was an address in Cairo. It was one of the Egyptians who had, had <laughs> in this way, given me his address. That meant, uh, my dear boy, when you can jump, come to us. I was safe. Yeah, but I couldn't jump. So the, that mirrors a bit the relationship there. And then I was in Cairo, but not in Cairo one. Uh, Shepherd's Hotel, but we were in the interrogation camp at Mahdi, west of Cairo. Well, I was uh, in my uh, room, nice room, with an Indian bed, not uncomfortable. And then I was led to a first interrogation, and that was uh, a Pole, a Polish major, but in British Air Force uniform. And I was lieutenant, and he behind his, his desk, he said, I'm a major. That means I'm your superior. Aha. And then he stood up, or jumped up, and said, What have you done to Poland? Oh, I said, Major, don't you know about the Bromberger Blue Blood Zo Sunday, Blood Sonntag, where they had done their first murdering of German minor minority civilians. He jumped up again and cried loudly, You are a Nazi! I must have shrugged my shoulders and said, So what? And now I said, Now it is out with Prussian officer. Now you have to answer my questions. And then he put questions and I said to him, you know, I cannot answer these. But my maid, my colonel wants to know. He suddenly said, yeah, sorry, uh, I don't speak about these things. Military matters, who my commander was, was names and so on and so on. Whew. And then it was, uh, he was very angry with me. And then he said, he really uh, threw me out of the, of the room. And when I had the handle of the door while I had it yet in hand, he said, and your mother will get no telegram. Poor mother. Um, by the way, we had an agreement, the British and the German forces, that if a prisoner uh, comes into the hands of the other forces, 
healthy or not, it will be reported. So that, uh, and when we were going over to the Suez camp, we were put into a rattling uh, railway car, an old fashioned one. And we were most of, and I, and two, two or four, two or three others. And we were guarded by a Scottish uh, sergeant in Scottish dress. And he forbade us to speak amongst each other and to speak to him. So we rattled on towards Sears. But my Scotsman, he had a flask here in his pocket, side pocket, and turned away from us. He sometimes took it and had it. Gulp. Uh, three times, I don't know. And then he opened up and he looked at me and he called me Göring because I was from the Luftwaffe. And he said, Look out, Göring, this damned. No, I think he, he used a word, but it starts with F. Desert. We should put them all into this desert. Roosevelt, Churchill. Mussolini, Hitler, and Stalin. And the war would be over. So he had, he had an autonomous thinking. <laughs> he gave the recipe how to end the war. And in Suez, most of and I, we made together our first try to escape. But we were caught, and we got four weeks calabush. For calabush, that is uh, arrest. Four weeks calabush. Then one, one day in uh, March or so, March 43, or was it in February in 43, we were starting from Suez uh, and went on a long, long voyage of two months on the, uh, on, the, on the invitation of the King of Great Britain, but for fifth class on a waterline. And it was a Cape Town castle, a converted um, passenger ship, converted as a troop to a troop carrier. And I had in uh, in uh, in the camp at uh, Suez, we had been buying. We had money. We got money as officers. We got it, not much, but we had. And uh, we were buying food from an Egyptian dealer in the middle of the camp. And we had bought lentils. And the Egyptian had bettered the weight and they had um, uh, put some stonies into the lentils. And I had uh, a hearty bite. And suddenly one of my femur teeth was cracked to the, to the, up to the root. Well, in this, with this, Tooth, I boarded uh, the ship and I said to the British, as soon as possible, I need a dentist in one of the harbors. Yes, we will see what we can do for you. And when the British said to me that, it was to me like a promise, but damned it was no promise. We, we touched at the ports of Aden, then far to the east to Bombay. And then we went into the to the south, when it, and it, at last it was becoming really cold. So we had invaded submarines there. And then we came up from the southeast to Durban. No dentist anywhere. And then at Durban, Durban I uh, committed to the British, to our guards, we, uh, I would now go on hunger strike. We had, had been always on deck of the ship, two times a day, so we saw a lot. Hunger strike. Well, and then they became lively. And when we went to Cape Town, here along the coast, heavily guarded by planes and by some cannon boat, then we were lying between Robben Island and, and the harbor in the middle, and there, suddenly, at night, a little ship had been coming in the dark, three o'clock or so, 
and I was woken up in my hammock and it were two army dentists who had to pull out the tooth. And I said, no, uh, no anesthesia. And I, I said to myself, damn, here is the enemy. You don't make a peep hold fast to your chair. <laughs> so I did, and they pulled the thing out. It was awful, pulled it out. And they spoke a language which I half understood. And I thought to myself, now these are the boor you have heard uh, from the from of, of the the uh, glorious fight against the British, these good marksmen. These are some of those. So, aha, yeah. And <coughs> they laughed amongst each other. And when they had pulled out the thing, one of them put his hand on my shoulder and said, "In good Afrikaans, young, what mark the Adolf?" Aha. Uh -huh. So I said to myself, "Yeah." Her friends, yeah, Naya. Yeah, yeah, we were lying there between the Robben Island and the harbor and we were just on promenading up on the deck and the funnel was sniffling and uh, the machine idling. Suddenly, full force, 90 degrees towards the harbor and we were asked to go down. We couldn't make out a thing of it. And one and a half years later in Canada, we are joined by a submarine captain of us. And he had brought, been brought up in one of the, the Atlantic battles. Or in one, one exchanges events and stories. And then one time he said yes. And I had been active in, the, in our actions at the South African coast. And then off Cape Town, I once I had a big troop ship of the castle class in my vision, and I wanted to send him just a fan. Fan is four torpedoes. I mean, it's a thing. <laughs> but they found out, and they rushed off. Yeah, and we compared the date, and that have been us. Has been us. Ah. Yeah. If he would have torpedoed us on deck, they were lying piled up rafts, thick rafts with ropes on the side. Oh, I would have gone on one of these rafts, have immigrated into South Africa already then. <laughs> now we did a lot of sports. It was a big sporting ground and uh, it was also a sort of a university. So many of our reserve officers, officers had, uh, had professions uh, of academic degree. And then we had uh, courses in military tactics even, in military history, in different languages, in law. I don't know, what's more? So we were very busy, and escaping was not out. They escaped, escaped, escaped. Just to keep the Canadians busy so that they couldn't send too many troops over to, to Europe and to, 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 to take in the air of freedom for some few days. It were not more than a few days because the mounted police of Canada was very good. And when, when we were brought in, I was also once out, we were brought in, again, four weeks calabush. I remember yet uh, one camp commander, he was not very happy because when, when prisoners of his camp were escaping too much, that was not good for his career. Naya, he was, I was brought in by a lieutenant and two men, and these men were half-castes, Indian white half-castes, and they were trigger-happy. And they had us two in the middle, and the, the men in the rear always begged his lieutenant in the front that he might take a good shoot on us, and, and said, sir, give me a chance. 
But sir didn't give a chance. And again, sir, give me a chance. And I had an ice cold feeling in my rear. <laughs> so we were brought in. Yeah, but the commander, he said, now we have you back, old boy. Good fun, huh? Four weeks, Calabos. Four weeks, Calabos. <laughs> And did you get uh, information and news from, from Germany? Yeah, from after a while the mail was, was established. So per month you had a, a special forms it was. You had two postal cards and one letter which you could fold to write. And then uh, out of this camp called Grande Ligne near Montreal, near Montreal it was, near Montreal was, uh, a good part of us were railwayed to the west and we came into a camp in the high Rocky Mountains. And we were seeing at far the, the, in a mountain camp. And we had uh, told the Canadians that when an, an, a German officer gives his words, best in writing, then it will be held. And so the, at last they allowed us to do promenades into the mountains. Say for five days, uh, five hours per day, you went to the guardhouse, uh, you uh, signed a sermon that during these five hours you wouldn't take up contact with civilians, you wouldn't escape, you wouldn't you know, things like, like that. And then we could do what we wanted, five hours in the free field. Yeah, yeah we could uh, we, we, uh, subscribe papers. We were, uh, having, were reading the New York Times and Washington Times and a Canadian paper. And then we had our secret receiver, which had been built by there was a trade with a watch, watchman. Uh, for instance, a watchman needed a repair of a watch or a repair of something like that. And this was done in the camp. And then he had to supply um, elements for the receiver. So it was built together after a while. And so, so we could hear our propaganda minister, Dr. Goebbels, and something like that. And also German news. Yeah. Yeah. So we had both news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the New York Times was very fair then. They were publicizing the war reports of all the warring parties, of the Germans, of the English, of the Japanese, of Russians. Side by side. On a yeah, uh, those who were shipped over to the Rocky Mountains were called as our post uh, receiving officer once saw a big list where we were listed under the heading Black and Ardent Nazis. Aha. So we thought at our comrades around, this is one that not. They had assembled all those who had. Uh, written so-called letters for the sender. That means a letter which would never get through uh, to our families, <clears throat> but where he opened his valve and was uh, shedding abuse on the Allies. So <laughs> what's like that? Those ones. The escapers, autonomous minded ones. <laughs> all the naughty ones. <laughs> yeah, the naughty ones. We're all there. <laughs> okay, so you, so you were... You, you were released a little bit later. Yeah, the, because of this I was released a bit of later. We were even in Britain. While we were there, we were against the international law. We were politically classified. And there was an, an, uh, a man who spoke German. In my case, it was a Czech. And who asked questions and I was... I was ill. Answering, huh? And I got classified as a Nazi. Group C, A, B, C. A were very clean, B were shady, and C were the big. And they gave me even some chaps with 
had the classification, as I later heard, later heard C+. Yeah. We were first, since we were in British hands, we were, we had been released in a British camp in Germany, and that was Munsterlager, north of Hanover. And there, uh, we came into a big hall, long tables, and there were British soldiers, and here were we, and we had our luggage to be controlled. But they were very uninterested. Big chalk cross on my sea sack and uh, not looked into. But I saw in a corner standing the rests and the, the, the trimmer when you have uh, destroyed furniture stand all heaped up. And I said to one of the Britishers, what is that? Ah, he said. Another day before, he said, the rest of the crew of the Panzerschiff Graf Spee, who were interned in, in, had been interned in uh, Argentine, were coming through here. And they all were very well to do. They had a lot of things which they possessed. And um, we had Polish control soldiers on the other side, not us. And the Polish ones were starting to pull out things from these sailors, luggage, for themselves. <coughs> and then one of the sailor, sailor uh, sapiers gave a, a pfeiffer signal, a pfeiffer through the fingers, and they jumped over the table onto the poles and they were uh, hitting them. And some of us stood in the rear and we said to them, do what you want, but no debt. And so the rest of the furniture standing there. And then they went uh, unrobbed or unstealed away, these uh, rest of the crew. And since then, there was peace in the field, and so the Britishers didn't look into ours. And then we came on a train, on a... On a on a goods train, partly open wagons, partly uh, sliding doors, and the train was going very slowly, the rails were yet damaged, the bridges were damaged, so to the south. I was, go uh, I was going to the south, to the American zone, where my, my uh, uh, engaged was living there. <clears throat> and where we halted, the populace was streaming on our, on our train, were uh, beautifying it with twigs and with even flowers outside, and we thought at last uh, that we were a, a victorious battalion, battalion coming home. So our populace was well in order then. And then we arrived in the American zone, and there at Dachau we were released again. In the early 50s, we had a meeting of the Stuka and the fighter bomber units, of all those who had remained in Göttingen. I then was studying in the, at the university at Göttingen, and so I organized the event. And we all came together and after long times, more than 10 years, we saw each other. It was a meeting of, I would say, strong characters who sometimes clashed and also had Big jokes all together. We were together there for two days. I think important is 
that at our common meeting in a, in a nice big hall above Göttingen, uh, we had a speech of Kuhlmeier. Kuhlmeier then had already entered the Bundeswehr, the early Bundeswehr, and had been uh, the lowest Generalmajor, I think. Yes, he was the rank of the general. And he naturally took the occasion to pursued us, to try to pursue us, also to join the Bundeswehr. Bundeswehr should be built up against the Russian menace with the dear Western allies in the rear. And most of us were not of the idea that we had to form a Bundeswehr at the side of the Western allies, because it were the Western allies who had created the mess of the partition of Germany and we shouldn't ladle out their dirty soup. Nothing of that sort. So, dear good Kulmai was more or less isolated. And I see him yet, how he stood leaning against a wall between two doors, ending his speech and then being attacked from all sides, jeered at even. Uh, bad words were flying, even personally. Uh, the thing was nasty and undisciplined. And in spite I didn't share the, the side of Kulmai, I was very sorry, I felt very sorry for him. So most of us then did not join the Bundeswehr, and I also did not. It was our first and last reunion, sorry to say. These were the Stuka and the uh, fighter bomber units. They were regarded, so to say, in one special arm of the Luftwaffe.